Greetings, uh, I'm Jim Finley. Welcome to Turning to the Mystics. Greetings, everyone. And welcome to our time here together at Turning for Guidance offered to us by the Christian mystic uh, Guigo II in his classic work, A Ladder of Monks. In the first session with Kirsten, kind of laid out the background information about Guigo and creating kind of a context for this text. And so we can move directly here into focusing on why I think this text can be particularly helpful to us because in a, in a, he gives such a succinct practical uh, guidelines for the actual experience of seeking God in prayer. And um, because I think when we listen to these mystics, there's, this, there's the flow of all these beautiful insights, you know, but where does it land? That is where, how can I experientially get in touch with that place where I'm committing myself to the actual experience of exploring these beautiful transformative realizations of God's presence in my life, in my prayer life, concretely, what's that look like? And I think that's so, what's so practical about this and so helpful. And so I'll, I'll, I'll begin right in, just as he starts right in, this is at the very beginning, this is chapter two of um, each of these chapters, by the way, the whole thing is only 17 pages long. And so each chapter, sometimes just a paragraph long, two paragraphs long. And um, so the second, the second uh, chapter, <clears throat> Rigo writes, One day when I was busy working with my hands, I began to think about our spiritual work, and all at once four stages in spiritual exercise came into my mind. Reading, meditation, prayer, and contemplation. These make a ladder for monks by which they are lifted up from earth to heaven. It has few rungs, yet its length is immense and wonderful, for its lower end rests upon the earth, but its top pierces the clouds and touches heavenly secrets. Then he tells us what these four rungs are. Reading, Lexio Divina, is the careful study of the scriptures concentrating all one's powers on it. And the second rung is meditation, is the busy application of the mind to seek with the help of one's own reason for knowledge of hidden truth. The third rung, prayer, is the heart's devoted turning to God to drive away evil and obtain what is good. And so the first three rungs then kind of correspond to Teresa of Avila, the first three mansions of the soul. And that they're the life of devotional sincerity. They're the life of prayerful experience of God's presence in our life. Um, and how to experientially ground ourselves in these grace evolving states of consciousness, of Lexio Divina, meditation and prayer, it is then going to open out upon and blossoms in this in mystical consciousness of infused contemplation where the soul's like lifted and raised above itself. And um, he, he, he um, repeats himself again. He kind of summarizes again in this very succinct way. The reading seeks for the sweetness of a blessed life. Meditation perceives it. Prayer asks for it. Contemplation, taste it. And, and I wonder, what I want to do here is um, I want to share with you how I experience each of these evolved, graced, evolving states of consciousness, both within myself and also over the years, just having sat with a lot of people and contemplative spiritual direction on retreats and so on. I'd like to make this as concrete and practical as possible as an actual experience. So hopefully it'll help you kind of concretize your own search for God in, in your own moments of prayer on this transformative journey toward union with God. <clears throat> and um, so I'll begin then. 
by saying first, I think that what matters first is that we, we, we come to our place of prayer and we sit and settle ourselves. And uh, I was just actually, just inadvertently, I saw on the internet, it was an excerpt of one of the talks that Thomas Merton gave to the novices at the monastery on prayer. And his, in his opening line, he says, the way where we begin in prayer <clears throat> is that we belong to God. And all the prayer starts, unfolds out of that, that knowledge that we belong to God. He said, but when we talk about prayer as a topic, it gets very complicated about methods and stages and, and so on. And so what we're trying to do here is to get past the topic of prayer to this deep experience that we belong to God and that we're God's beloved. And so we go to our place of prayer and we sit, Thomas Merton says, with God a little sincerity goes a long, long way. And we sit in prayer, renewing our faith that we're sitting there in God's presence, all about us and within us, closer to us than we are to ourselves. And we've come here with no other intention but a kind of rendezvous with God as a way to turn to God to help us to deepen our experience of and response to God's presence in our life. That's, that's why we're there. It's a, it's a, it's a moment of intimacy, of uh, devotional sincerity, of this deepening this union with God in prayer. And it starts with Lexio Divina, with reading. And by reading, he primarily, preeminently means scripture and uh, the gospels, words of Jesus, the Psalms, you know, the writings of Paul, all of scripture, but it can also mean um, the, the writings of any, it means this, that reading is a stance of listening to words in which we intuit or sense in the cadence and rhythm of the words that God is personally speaking to us in these words that we're listening to. So preeminently in scripture, but now in Guigo, in the words of the mystics, sometimes it's the words of poets. But there's something, there's something I discern in these words, the presence of God incarnate and in speaking to me in these words. And I, I, I sense first in sitting there, that I sense first in the reading then as a stance of attentive uh, listening infused with love. That's, that's where I would like to start. That, that Lexio Divina, the first rung of the ladder to heaven, is reading as a, as a great state of consciousness, of sustained attentiveness infused with love, receptively open to the love that's pouring itself out and giving itself to us breath by breath, heartbeat by heartbeat, and now personally giving itself to us in these words that we're now listening to. And as we listen to these words, then, um, and the sustained attentiveness infused with love, we, we notice that these words are so beautiful and we know that they're beautiful because they're true. They're, they're words of solace or they're words of uh, reassurance. They're words of a kind of uh, disarming simplicity. It's, they're heartfelt words that go right to our heart. And as we listen to these words, there's a certain moment where spontaneously we move from this first rung of the ladder, which is this lexio, this, this listening. We might say when, when, it's, when, it's, when it's actually being spoken like this, it's like divine listening or listening to the, the print, to the words. We move to the second rung of the ladder, which is meditation. And I like to make here a distinction too, where I think Kuigo can help us about how we use these words. Because this can be confusing sometimes. The word meditation can mean different things. That for Guigo, for John of the Cross, for Teresa, for Ecosi, that meditation, they always mean by usually discursive meditation. That is, meditation 
is um, a, a way of meditating using thoughts and imagery and words. And this is going to be distinct from when he gets to contemplation, which is kind of wordlessly resting in the presence of God beyond words, beyond images, and so on. It's confusing because in the, in the, in the yoga tradition, in deep yoga, a tradition to practice meditation when they use the word meditation they mean what the, the christian mystics mean by contemplation and likewise in the buddhist texts in zen and the writings of the buddhist sutras the sayings of the buddha to practice meditation the seventh step the eightfold path right um, meditation right, right eighth right concentration they they mean by meditation what the christian mystics mean by contemplation it isn't that they don't, don't see the importance of, and the texts themselves are a discursive process. I mean, you're reading a text, there's words, and you're listening, of course. But the, the word meditation for them is reserved in this state of this contemplation. Where in Christianity, when we read it in this Christian, Christian mystical tradition, meditation means discursive meditation, using thoughts and images. It, mean, it, it means it in this way. It means it in this way. It means that I listen in receptive openness, this sustained receptivity infused with love, Lexio. Then in a certain moment, it goes like this, I think, poetically, we'd put it this way, that God says to us, you know, now I've spoken to you in these words. I've spoken personally to you. Now it's your turn. You, you talk to me. You know, what do you think? Kind of, where are you at with this in this in this dialogue? That is, in these words that I've heard, what are the insights, or what are the questions, or what are the concerns? Like personalize it, like like meet me here in kind of an encounter. So discursive meditation then is a flow of thoughts, of a flow of words, where the words are expressing what's received in silence. There is the interior silence of the lexio, and the silence gives birth to, to wonderings or concerns or questions or insights that we personally engage in the word that was heard and return it back by speaking back to God, like where we are with this. And as that, not, as that kind of winds down automatically, it gives rise to new insights, and we listen again to the lexio a new layer of insight, which gives rise to a new layer of a meditatio, a deepening exchange. Uh, for some people, they quite naturally uh, follow this process through journaling. They, they write out like a, like the, the initial word of the Lexio is God's love letter to us. And then our journaling is the love letter back to God, uh, like the heartfelt loving exchange between ourselves and God in this word. And in, as this process goes on, then the third rung of the ladder is the heart center, which is desire. And we say to God, you know, help me with this, really. I, I desire to abide in this union that's growing within me now in my childlike sincerity in this simple hour here with each other. Yeah, I, 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 want, to, I want to go deeper. Uh, I want to stabilize in it. I want to uh, live by it day by day. I can't do this without you. I can't do this without you. So you who, um, in an ongoing act of love, are pouring yourself out and giving yourself to me as my very life, breath of my breath, the soul of my soul, Merton says, beating in my very blood whether I want it to or not. And you who gave me the capacity to awaken to your presence, and it's you who are awakening in me the desire for you, which is really an echo of your desire for me. You created me to have someone to give yourself to. But I, I, I it's, it's, see, from my heart, uh, I, I need to go beyond words. I need to go beyond methods, beyond strategies for this deepening communion with you. And, uh, th and that's our prayer. And uh, we notice also that this is something, this is another important thing here, I think. Uh, 
I put it, you know, that which is unessential is constantly imposing itself. That which is essential never imposes itself. And this love is what's essential. This love, this this is this is this is a oneness without which nothing else makes any sense, really. And so we we but this that which is essential never imposes itself. That which is unessential is constantly imposing itself. That is God's always there, but we, we we can't see God because the concerns and complexities and burdens and worries of the day are blocking our view. So we're trying to set aside a time with God's help to let all that isn't going to go away. It's there waiting for us. This, this you know the cell phone's going to go off. I mean, whatever. Like you have your life, I have mine. But here's a, here's a rendezvous where there's no agenda but love. And um, I, I seek then to follow this love, but I, I just can't do it once. And then uh, it kind of clicks in, and I got, I, then it's all taken care of. It's a habit. It's, it's, it's a subtle habit. I have to commit myself to it for this daily rendezvous. So that little by little by little, as the weeks and months and years go by, fidelity, obediential fidelity to this longing to deepen my experience and response to God's presence becomes ever more broad-based, ever more habitual. And this is why we end each session of prayer, asking God for not to break the thread of this awareness as we go through the day, to kind of so that little by little it'll become an underlying habitual um, set of sensitivities or sensibilities to God's presence in the midst of every situation, like this kind of uh, the path of uh, ever deeper habituated discipleship, ever deeper habituated God's oneness in life. It's like that. And that this, this then when in, in God's good time can then blossom into, into contemplation. But in this session, I want to stay with the first three steps. I want to stay longer with it. And um, I want to... Um, share two texts um, that I use when I share this with people. One text represents um, passages where we are in times of joy. And here in the Psalms, my shepherd is the Lord, there's nothing I shall want, beside restful waters you lead me, you give me repose, and so on. And, um, and in this Psalm, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing I shall want. Um, I, I'd like to use it. I'd like to engage in Lexio out loud with you as I engage in it, my meditatio and my prayer. And then I want to take a text about sorrow and fear and share with you a personal sense of Lexio, meditation and prayer, so that it might help you to see how these... Um, these rhythms or these patterns are woven into the joys and the sorrows, the blessings and the burdens and fears of our life. So I'll begin first then with, my shepherd is the Lord, there's nothing I shall want. Um, and so I sit here and I read it, and so when I, when I text, my shepherd is the Lord, there's nothing I shall want. And then I stop at Lexio, and I listen to God personally telling me, I am your shepherd, and in me, in relationship with me, there is nothing you shall want. I hear God personally is telling me this in this moment, and in my heart I know that it's true. And I take it in, and I recognize it as beautiful, because it is beautiful. And in my heart I know that it's beautiful, because it's true. And so my sustained receptivity, I, I let my heart be accessed by God personally speaking to me in that re reassuring words. And then my meditatio, so I listen to that, then God says, well, I talk to me. Like, what do you think? What about this? And so I'm going to do, do meditation out loud with you this way. Yes, Lord, I know, I, I know this is true. I mean, in my heart, I know that it's true. Then I'm wondering, then, um, what are the waters in which you give me repose? What are these 
these pastures of repose. And is, is it perhaps this relationship in my life, this, this, the beloved, you know, the intimate other, that you, that you are the reality in, you, in which I'm, I'm resting and you resting in the intimacy and the sweet exchanges and closeness of this relationship? Is it uh, this child in my life? reading a child a good night story this kind of disarming simplicity of the child that there i'm reposing in you and reposing in the presence of the child the child's presence uh, the friend the grandmother the god grandfather father mother sister brother that person in whose presence i sense something that their presence makes my life uh, qualitatively better because of their presence in it and my relationship with that person, with this family, with this community, see, is uh, the restful waters where you give me repose. Is it in my my quiet hour at day's end? Is, is the waters where you give me repose? It's happening right now with you in this sincerity, this kind of unhurried, vulnerable, childlike sincerity of being open that I'm even capable of a sensibility such as this, as subtle as they might be, as delicate as they might be, that these are the waters where you are giving me repose. Is it the situation that I'm in, which I, I find a certain meaning, a certain ministry or certain work where I'm contributing something to the human endeavor? through my gifts and my abilities? Is it listening to a certain poet, and the rhythms of their voice, or certain music? Is the long, slow walk to no place in particular? What are these moments? Um, th these are the moments. These are the moments where you give me repose. And so help me to be even more grateful and even more sensitive to this. And in asking for your help is my prayer, my desire. Because I, although I know this is true, in my mind as I meditate on this is true, it's, it's elusive to me. Like it, it's there, but it's hard to stabilize in it. It like, it slips away because of the distractedness of my mind and heart. It, it's hard to keep a steady gaze on it, even though you are unwaveringly present in my wavering ways. My wavering ways swing so out of reach, I kind of, I, I, sl I slip off the path. So help me, help me uh, to my desire. And I know that my desire to stabilize in this is an echo of your desire for me. And uh, that I might be ever more habitually stabilized in this ever deepening communion between us that is always there. It's the true nature of every moment passing moment of my life, as Merton says, it's beating in my very blood, whether I want it to or not. And so now as I end this time with you and I go about my day, I ask you now not to break the thread of this awareness that as I go through my day, and I know it'll break many times, because it'll break every time I get reactive, every time I buy into the illusion that what's happening has the power to name who I am. And I hope that every time it breaks, to know that although it breaks from my end, the thread never breaks from your end. And you are sustaining me and guiding me, and you're there with me throughout the day, so that maybe through the day, here and there, as if out of the corner of my eye, I'll catch little glimpses of you in the midst of the situation like this, and you, and you go off to live your day. And then the next day you come back, you sit down, and uh, you begin anew. You know, like, where were we, Lord? Oh, yes. Yes, we was left off with um, your presence here with me now and me with you and reflecting on all the ways you're present to me through the blessings and peaceful and moments of my life. And uh, today, I I'd like to reflect, and maybe as I come to you right now, I'm burdened by something. I'm, there's, I, I'm fearful about something that's going on with me, of uncertain outcome, either for me or somebody that I love. And um, 
And so I, I like to open the scriptures and hear you. So, so I open to the text where Jesus says, the gospel's like, fear not, do not be afraid, fear not. Uh, I, I, I'm with you always. And that's the text. So I sit, I renew my presence that I'm sitting here in your presence all about me and within me, closer to me than I am to myself. And uh, I know your deathless presence. You're speaking to me personally right now, telling me not to be afraid. In the midst of my fear, don't be afraid. And telling me the reason why not to be afraid is that you're with me. You're with me in the midst of this concern, this fearful thing this, that, that weighs on me. Like this. And there, when I hear you telling me not to be afraid, in my lexio, and letting my, let it, I have to let it sink in. That is, I have to calm down enough that I can calm down enough and get quiet enough to hear you saying this to me, not to be afraid. And I trust it because my heart senses that it's beautiful. And my heart senses that there's a truth in it. My heart knows that it's true. And uh, so in my meditatio, then, I engages me in a dialogue with you about it. So here's my meditatio on, on fear not, personal for me. I say this, by the way, out of my own history with trauma and as a therapist working with trauma for 20 years, sitting with people, you know, in the midst of their fear. So I think I'm being influenced by this and touching on this about the sadness of life. There's, um, you know, Lord, uh, you're telling me not to be afraid, but I'm, 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 cons I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that. Because uh, you were afraid. In the Garden of Gethsemane, you, you, knew the, the, you knew the crucifixion. You saw crucifixions. You, you saw the traumatizing thing that was about to happen to you. It says that you sweat blood, that you were in a traumatized state. And so you're telling me not to be afraid, but you were afraid. Is it, is it possible then that I don't understand what you mean by not being afraid? Do you mean to not to be afraid, it encouraged me not to be afraid of being afraid? That is, it isn't as if I know you're going to give me the strength to get through this as best I can, and I will get through it one way or the other. But um, you're asking me to have peace in the midst of engaging in this unfolding painful loss or dilemma or justice or whatever it is that I'm going through. In an inner peace that's not dependent on the outcome, because it's your peace upon which everything depends. That there's a peace, I'm, that this would mean that you're, you're a presence that protects me from nothing, obviously. You were protected from the crucifixion. You protect me from nothing, even as you unexplainably sustain me in all things. And that's the sense in which you're with me, like this. That, um, and so I, 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 I ask for the grace then to, um, to, to let this sink in this, in this dialogue with you. I'm, I'm opening myself up to go deeper a deeper way to understand what it means to understand not to be afraid. Not doesn't mean not to be afraid when the scary thing happens. Maybe I, I should be afraid. It's scary. And uh, maybe it's not going to go well. Sometimes it doesn't. But is there something? Is there something in the depth of your oneness with me that's unexplainably sustaining me in this? And that sometimes maybe even in the midst of the scary journey, uh, I can find myself being unexplainably sustained by you sustaining me in the midst of the painful thing. Like a kind of a quiet wisdom that I myself can understand. And then I'm overtaken again by the intensity of the emotion. Then it appears again like this. As I ride the waves of circumstance and get the help that I can and see, we'll see how it goes. But knowing how matter how it goes, you're one with me in it unexplainably. And so my prayer is I need your help with this. See, I need your help with this. 
you know, where you said of the text, you know, be, be wise as a serpent and simple as a dove, that you were wise as a serpent, that is, you were street smart. You were not naive about the suffering ways of this world. Look how your life ended in human terms. Seriously, really. And yet be simple as a dove. And we're not to be naive or Pollyannish about how mean-spirited and cruel and hurtful life can be. Not to ourselves, just turn on the evening news, to humanity, through prejudice, through poverty, through ignorance. It's just, the world's a precarious place. And, um, uh, but see, to be, not to be so street smart that we forget how to be simple as a dove, to unexplainably sustained, come in May by this love of yours that sustains me through and through and through and through and through and through. And I can't, I can't come to this without your help, especially I can't abide in it because look how mercurial I am. You know, I'm on a learning curve here. And so help me as I go through the day to be a bit more grounded in this and more present in this. And, uh, and I got up and I go through my day. And the next day I come back again. I where do we light my candle? Or about whatever help, whatever sacramentals help you to light a candle, the open scriptures, picture of Jesus, the icon, whatever your tradition is or in the midst of nature. And where do you start again? You start on the first rung of the ladder. Sometimes we fall off the ladder because we try to skip the first rung. We start to talk before we've listened. See, we, we were so full of our own voice, we haven't got quiet enough, long enough to hear God's quiet voice echoing deeply in an unhurried sovereignty in our heart. And we take it into ourselves. And uh, so I think this is the path that Guigo is talking about. Now, there's something else, too, uh, I think that's helpful in, in looking at this. Uh, Guigo says, right in the middle of this passage that I just shared with you, Guigo says, right in the middle of this passage, I skipped these sentences right here, in the middle of what I shared with you earlier. See, just as its rungs or degrees have different names and numbers, they differ also in order and quality. And if anyone inquires carefully into their properties and functions, what each one does in relation to us, the differences between them and their order of importance, he will consider whatever trouble and care he may spend on this, little and easy in comparison with the help and consolation that he gains. I'd like to reflect on this. <clears throat> See, uh, my sense is this, that he's inviting us here to be a contemplative person is a certain kind of experiential self-knowledge where we quietly contemplate on the way we are where, in the, where we're in the graced state of Lexio consciousness. That is, I, I am in Lexio consciousness. I sit, I renew my awareness of God's presence. I open the scriptures. And I listen to God's word speaking to me in the rhythm and cadences of these words of Jesus or the mystic or the poet, whatever. And in that stance of listening, the divine listening, Lexio Divina, divine listening, Lexio reading, see, it reveals me to myself that I'm capable of that. Pretty amazing, really. It's pretty amazing. And, and therefore, and also notice when I'm in that state, notice I'm in a kind of very mysterious, there's something celestial about it. It's something so simple. There's no posing, there's no posturing. I've not even yet said anything yet myself. I'm just simply in a stance of receiving the flow of this, your living word and the rhythms of this word into my heart as a great state of consciousness like this. And it grounds me in something that matters very much. And it bears witness that I'm capable of that. And then in the meditatio, I look at having heard you speak to me, you're waiting for me to talk to you. 
that you and I are in, like in a loving exchange with each other, and you're infinitely interested in everything I say because you're infinitely in love with me. And so as I as I share with you my confusion, or I share with you my, uh, you know, my concerns about my racing mind, or my stuck place, or whatever, you're right there, infinitely attentive to everything that I say in, in the Lexio, or in the Meditatio, because my words are echoing back my own heart that's been awakened by your words to me. And when that, when that dies down, because this is completely uncontrived, like an intimate exchange between intimate friends, as it automatically winds down, I become silent. And in the silent, the lexio begins again. There's another wave of listening to something. Or maybe with the words I just said to you, I, I hear it echoed back to me as, as your voice coming to me that I might listen to more deeply what I just said. Like that. I think a lot of psychotherapy is like this, actually. A lot of psychotherapy is being with somebody who keeps slowing you down to listen at the feeling level to what you just said. And I might be present like this. And I'm capable of this kind of exchange. That my mind, my reflective mind, doesn't all isn't limited to being caught up in the in the in the in the, in the details of the day. All that's real in its own level. I gotta sort stuff out and do the errands and I mean all that's real. But my own meditatios bears witness that I'm capable of I have a great state of consciousness that's actualized in me. My own heart bears witness to it. Like this, my own mind bears witness to it. I'm capable of that. It's pretty amazing. Really, and in my desire to be habituated in it is a state of consciousness of longing of a certain longing, a certain unconsummated longing. See, a longing for an abiding union not yet realized. I'm capable of that because it's an echo of your longing for me. And the unconsummated nature of my longing is the kind of encounter point between us where you and you alone can consummate the longing that you yourself are the, the, the essence of and the reality of. You're the origin of my longings. Like this, I'm capable of this. It's pretty amazing, seriously. And then there's something else, too. If I compare the way I am in, in these grace subtle states, when I'm in lexio consciousness, meditatio consciousness, reflection, and prayer, I compare that to my states of consciousness when I'm exiled from that, which unfortunately is a lot of my waking hours, actually. <laughs> my, my worrisome ruminations fretting so the way I so often do. And so in the light of the way I am in these moments, it illumines the way I am when I'm not in these moments, which is my state of exile. I can start to become more aware of how unaware I tend to be. And what is my response to this? to return back to your presence, to return back to your presence, the remedy for my dilemma. And I return back to the rendezvous with you, listening to how you love me so through and through and through and through and through, in the fragility of myself, experiential self-knowledge like this. And so this is the way I think where can we go for us. And I, I have one more final little thought to end on. And, and it's it's this I think. It isn't as if this these these degrees of the, the rungs of this ladder are limited alone to God, but rather are the rungs of states of consciousness that carry over into every moment of our life. So, for example, let's say we're talking with somebody, the, the beloved, the spouse, or the friend, and uh, as we listen to what they're saying. <clears throat> Just, they're just sharing themselves with us. You know, the, the, what happened today, I mean, whatever it is. Can I sit and realize that this is a kind of alexio? And can I tell God, can I hear you speaking to me in the cadences and rhythms and details of what this beloved person is sharing with me? 
Or have you ever had the experience where you're listening to someone who's in, who's hurting, like they're scared and overwhelmed and this one, and uh, you, as you listen out of your love for them, you say something they find helpful, and you don't know how you knew how to say that, really. And so what is, what is the lexio uh, of, of listening to everyone? Someone, what, what, is it, what is the lexio of take, walking outdoors and listening to the wind? What is the lexio of um, listening to music? What is the lexio of reading a poet out loud to yourself and the rhythms of the poetic voice? What is the lexio, this attentive stance, um, sustain this, uh, this listening, a listening presence? And, uh, and likewise, then, what is the meditatio? How can I engage with each person in a, in a thoughtful way? Like how, what can I do to see to it that our encounter is authentic, that it rings true, it's sincerity. I know this has to do with the, because you know, in the workplace, you take it for what it is. It might be just something or somebody at the store. Um, you're walking out with a cup of coffee and they give you your change and you say, thank you. You know, and then someone stops and open the door for you. How can you begin to see in an habituated state the holiness of the simplicity and the rhythms of the ordinariness uh, of life itself. So I, I know, unlike we go and we're talking about this with Kirsten, we, you know, we don't live. We're not. We're not. That might be some cloistered people listening to this. I don't know, <laughs> but we, we don't. We don't live a, a silent cloistered life. For every detail is carefully designed to nurture and cultivate exactly what we is talking about. But uh, Merton wrote from that, but he wrote to all of us, because we're living it out here. We have to grow where we're planted. How can I live a How can I be a contemplative man or woman in the midst of the world? And so therefore, I, I hope this has helped you to see where you are. Because what really matters is this: is when you stop and where you are in a moment of prayer. That's the crest of the wave. Everything else is just words. Everything else is just worse. Where are you at? As poor as it is, or confused as it is, or fragile as it is, that's not the point. The point is, where are you in the vulnerable sincerity of being present there because God's unexplainably present to you? And you can learn to slow it way down to be present, to let it soak in and walk with it, and kind of slow down enough to catch up with yourself and develop the habit of doing that. And so then next time we'll be talking then about contemplation, uh, where this starts to blossom into mystical dimensions of infused contemplation and how that, uh, in conf that infused state, then we'll see next, how that, how that uh, washes down through, down through the daily details of our life. Um, and so, um, with that, then we'll end with the sitting, with the meditation. With the meditation. And so look, you know, we're going to sit in, in silence here for a few minutes. And so it'd be interesting, and having heard a talk about meditation, when you sit in silence, where are you at in meditatively sitting? With How does all this strike you? And you're listening to it, and you're quiet and there's change between you and God with it your desire to stabilize in it, where this kind of comes home to rest and actually giving ourselves over to it. I'll give myself over to it. You give yourself over to it. That's the, that's the essence of the matter, really, I think. So with that, then, I um, invite you to sit straight, uh, fold your hands, and bow. Repeat after me. Be still and know I am God. Be still and know I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be.
Atem Bao. Slowly say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Mary, Mother of Contemplatives, pray for us. We go the same. Pray for us. Blessings. Till next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Turning to the Mystics, a podcast created by the Center for Action and Contemplation. We're planning to do episodes that answer your questions. So if you have a question, please email us at podcasts at cac.org or send us a voicemail at cac.org forward slash voicemails. All of this information can be found in the show notes. We'll see you again soon.